I'm sure you picked up on the three familiar words in all those verses. The uh, I am come. I, you know, uh, we appreciate all of the scriptures, but there's something about the Lord's words. There's something, Amen. there's something, you know, just they're, they're, they're special. And I'm eager to bring you uh, this tonight. Now, the Lord said, he said, I am come. One time he said, I am come to bring fire on the earth. And, and oh, I wished it was already kindled. And he said one time, don't think that I've come to bring peace. This, now, when the Lord says, I am come, now this is different from any other person that's, that's, that's talking. Uh, this phrase, incidentally, is, is, is used and recorded in the Gospels a, a couple of dozen times. And uh, you recognize it when you hear it. You recognize it. This belongs to the Lord. <laughs> This I am come. This is the way Jesus spoke. And, you know, only Jesus can speak this way. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Jesus is the only one that can claim to have come to this earth from some other place. I mean, he was born here on the earth just like we're born. But that's, that's where the similarities and the likenesses end right there, you see, because Jesus comes from some other place. Uh, the Lord told uh, it, 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 what I mean is uh, the religious leaders and all uh, thought that Jesus came from Nazareth, you see. When he says, I am come, they, they're thinking Nazareth, right? But Jesus, he, uh, he told the religious leaders one time, ye are from beneath, I, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. We hear Jesus saying things such as, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. And it's a straightforward style of Jesus. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And we know that the religious leaders, now they didn't miss any of these declarations of Jesus, these statements. They, they picked up on all these things. Uh, Jesus declares not only to come down from heaven, you see, but he, 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 uh, he says that he came down from the Father. And so uh, in John 10, Jesus was attending the Feast of Dedication. It was wintertime. You remember the account. And Jesus was walking along the scriptures, say, of Solomon's porch, and the religious leaders encircled him. And they, and they asked him, How long will you evade us? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And so he answered, and I told you already, and you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear, they bear witness of me. And he continues his response, and, and he told them clearly, I and my Father are one. Amen. And, and uh, you're familiar with this count, and at the hearing of the scriptures, the Jews pick up stones to stone him. You remember that? And uh, Jesus said, uh, many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of those works did you stone me? For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, thou being as man, claimest or makest thyself God. You know, so in response to that, Jesus just simply tells them, and here's my point, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I am him. You see what I'm saying? Jesus said, I am come. I am come from the heaven, I've come from the Father. And the, the mighty display of power, miracles, and good deals, and all and good deeds, and all manner of healings, even raising the dead, just Jesus is pointing out that the Father in heaven had put his stamp of approval on him. Amen. This Jesus of Nazareth I'm talking about, in John 6, feeding of the 5,000, you're familiar with this account also, great multitudes, incidentally, regularly followed Jesus from place to place. This was, this was common. They saw Jesus only for the benefit of the miracles, however. But Jesus wanted to make it clear in this, this incident here that he did not come from heaven just to simply to fill men's stomachs. He said, labor not for the meat which perished, but for that meat which endured unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you uh, for him that God the Father sealed. I don't know if I read that right or not. Labor not for the meat which perished, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you unto you for him that the, the Father has sealed. That's better. Moses gave you the manna in the wilderness, Jesus said, but it's God who gives you the true bread from heaven. <clears throat> now, it caused the people to murmur and stumble over this statement and, uh, and because they said, isn't this Joseph? Uh, isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came from heaven, you see? 
And Jesus asked him, What if you see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? In, the world, in other words, if, if you're not able to see all the, if, if you're able to see all the miracles I do, yet cannot believe what I say, how would you be able to believe even if you saw the Son of Man ascend to heaven? You, uh, how would you be able to believe? He said, I am come from heaven and from the Father. The good things that Jesus did through the miracles were done so that the faith of God's people could take hold of these things and take hold of the truth. The Jews didn't disapprove or have any problem with Jesus' wonderful works. They didn't disapprove of his miracles or anything like this, but they denied his power came from God. So we noticed Jesus, many good works had that just had no effect on them. There was zero effect on them. They had no faith. And without faith, the miracles could not serve as the testimony that the power of the Father was with him. Jesus one time said to them, If I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not, if another shall come in his name, him you will receive. <clears throat> All of the people far and wide knew Jesus of Nazareth. He was a man full of good works. They knew this. Mighty in power. And Peter claims it was these good works, you see, that he showed to the people that he was approved of God. Listen to the apostle. You men of Israel, he did hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. And many said, yes. You remember, this is the day of Pentecost. Many said, yes, this is the truth. This is what must we do. And 3,000 were added to the body of Christ that day. We talked about that this morning. This is Peter again in chapter 10, talking about God put his seal on this man, Jesus. In the 10th chapter of Acts, when Peter finally makes it to the house of Cornelius, he finds Cornelius and all his household is already assembled and ready to hear what Peter has to say about Jesus of Nazareth. Cornelius and all those gathered were no strangers now to the news and reports concerning Jesus. Everyone had heard of Jesus of Nazareth, and his fame had spread throughout all the region. And the fame of him, the scriptures say, went out into every place of the country round about, and great multitudes came to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Now, this is how Peter began to preach to them. Ye know, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, Peter went on, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him, you see. That day, Peter baptized Cornelius and his whole, uh, all of the people that were there. Jesus walked with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he said unto them, what manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad. What are y'all talking about? That's gotten you so sad and distraught, Jesus said. And one of them said, answering, Art thou a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which is a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God, and all the people. A prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God. This is how Jesus of Nazareth was pointed out by God, you see. The man born blind, John 9. Jesus heals this man from birth. Uh, he was blind from birth. He heals him. And because he does it on the Sabbath day, you remember, it was immediately reported to the uh, religious leaders and the Pharisees. And you remember how the account goes. This miracle caused a great division among them. Some of them couldn't imagine that a man from God would heal someone on the Sabbath day. But the others said, well, if the man is not from God, how did he heal him then? It was a great division. And, uh, and so the Pharisees asked a man the third time, okay, we'll go to the third time, about, uh, tell us about this man who healed you again. And do you remember the man's response? The man answered him and says, Why? Wherein is this a marvelous thing, that you know not whence he is? Yeah. Yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, God heareth him. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes 
of one that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And this is the right conclusion, isn't it? This is the conclusion that God wants men to come to. And if you've got faith, you'll come to this conclusion in a few years. That Jesus was on the earth with the disciples. Men were miraculously fed. Men were healed of all manner of sicknesses and diseases, Amen. and he raised men from the dead Amen. so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Do you remember when the, uh, John the Baptist sent two disciples to Jesus and asking him, are you the one or should we look for another? Yeah. What did Jesus tell the disciples? Go and show John again those things which you, you see and, and, uh, and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus referred John the Baptist and the disciples back to the scriptures, probably maybe somewhere like Isaiah 60 or somewhere in, the, I think, the 31st chapter. But they, he fulfilled the scriptures. They actually pointed out the Messiah to, to those who had faith in God. The power of God rested on those who, for whom God was pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the miracles proved, you see, that God was pleased with Jesus. Amen. As we continue to follow the account of the scriptures, very quickly, I hope, the same power of God rested on the apostles, you notice. As God continues to authenticate the apostles as, though, as those men who had been with Jesus, how did he do it? Well, in Acts, the fourth chapter, Peter and John are brought before the, before the Sanhedrin. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned ignorant men, and they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You remember this whole account now started when they healed a lame beggar at the gate of um, Beautiful. And he, he, uh, the man came into the temple area, and he raised such a ruckus, so to speak, leaping and shouting and praising God, that immediately a crowd formed, and Peter preached to them. So, uh, and so as this huge multitude of people gathered, Peter took to preach and listen to what he preached. Why ye marvel at this? Why do you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. The scriptures say the number which received this word and believed incidentally were about 5,000. So that was a big crowd that came. Peter said it wasn't by our own power. It was the power of God through the preaching of Jesus Christ which caused this man to walk. <clears throat> With observable signs of power from God and all kinds of miracles and mighty deeds, Jesus said, I come. And Sarah read the scripture. He said, I come a light into this world. I come in this world for judgment. And I come that they might have life. Now, it was Apostle John who wants us, when we think of Jesus, we, he wants us to think of him as the light of the world. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus, the light, and the life of men is his theme throughout his letters, incidentally. John starts off his epistle in this manner, that all men are in the dark. Darkness, that's where men are found. And we agree with the Apostle in his choice of word, darkness. It's not just a metaphor. Incidentally, this is just about as accurate a statement as you can make. If the Apostle John, now he can speak about light and things like this because he was one who had received the light. Yeah. He had been illuminated himself. So we listen to the Apostle John. He says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We know in the way John speaks, the light shined on him for sure. And so speaking also of those who would come to the truth. The same apostle writes in 1 John 2, 8 later on. He reflected upon this, and he says again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, you see, and the true light now shineth. Early in Matthew, count chapter 4, that it might be fulfilled in Isaiah, the people sat in darkness, remember? And they saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region, in shadow of death, light has sprung up. This is in reference to the area, the region and, uh, where Jesus grew up. But, of course, it's representative of the whole world, isn't it? The whole world which sits also in darkness under the shadow of death. Jesus said, I come a light into the world. Now, 
someone who likes to talk about this, this is such a big subject, you could talk about it all night, this, this idea of Jesus being a light in the world. But here is something that Jesus would have us to know, or would have us to remember, that Jesus becomes, in, he comes in behalf of the Father. You see, when you're talking about light. Jesus Christ and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, okay, but on him that sent me. And he that sent me, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I'm come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. We are familiar with the fact that Jesus is the spokesman for the Father. We know all this. We talk about it often. Jesus is the appointed spokesman for God. And we can handle this truth very well. We also, it's equally true that Jesus has to come to remove sin, and, and to such an extent he removed the sins of the entire world. But uh, what we want, the idea we want to know, uh, focus on, is Jesus has come not only to uh, speak for the Father, but he's also come to show us the Father, you see. And this is the light. Of, he comes as a light, and, and he's shedding the light on who the Father is, you see, in this, in this, in this darkness. We have to say it this way. Jesus is working in behalf of the purpose of God to give men a Savior was God's idea, you see. It was God's idea. It, it, we wouldn't have never known. Amen. The scriptures tell us, as a man, Jesus returned from the dead and he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. These are the accomplishments of Jesus. Now, in, the, uh, in the, the complex way, sometimes we go about talking about gospel and the exposition of the gospel. Sometimes we can forget the simplicity of it, okay, that, uh, that Jesus is the representative man, okay? Yes. Everything he accomplished has an application to us because he's a man, Christ Jesus, because he did all these things as a man. Peter said that death could not hold him because it was not right that he be there. Now, when we talk about reconciliation and things such as this, you know that reconciliation, when we talked about it this morning already, reconciliation was for God. We were reconciled for God. The purpose was to reconcile to God all those who were alienated from him by sin. Jesus said, I come to do the will of the Father. So then Jesus speaks for God, and he's working in behalf of God. So Jesus said, I am the light of the world, yet a little while is this light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While ye have the light, Believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things Jesus spake and departed, and he hid himself. This is John 12, and it was his last public statement just about. Uh, in a few days, Jesus will be hanging on a cross. And, and the men, what was ironic about this, men would be trying to extinguish this light. So the condition of men is that they're in darkness and that they desire to flee from the light. The light is offensive to them, to those who are in the regions of darkness it is. It makes evil deeds and motives known, and men try to remove themselves from the light for that reason. The Apostle John says, 3, 9, 3, 19 and 21, And this is a condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Therefore their e deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that there are wrought in God. What about those who come to the light? Let's talk about those for a moment. Instead of fleeing like, like some do, there's those who come to the light. <clears throat> talk about those who want the light. We're talking about those who want the light of God to shine on them. Uh, they're found among those who don't want the light to shine on them. <clears throat> they, they don't run from the light. They run to the light. How do we account for this kind of behavior and this kind of response to the light? While others are running away, we have them running too. This has been the testimony all along. We all, in, in the accounts, Jesus would speak 
to the multitudes and it would say and some believed he would speak to the he would have an engagement with the uh, priest and the religious leaders and then down below it would say and and some of them believe this is all this has been the nature of it he that doeth the truth cometh to the light we already know we we already know we can talk about this we already know there's there's we've met those who are sensitive to the truth Amen. there are those who are not this, it, we get, there's people who are sensitive to the truth, and there's people that there's people you can talk to. You can, you can, I can talk to that person about the things of the kingdom, and there's other folks that you just, well, you just do, you go about your business. You know they don't want to hear it. Yeah. These are the ones that Jesus has come for, brethren. Those who come to the light, and those who hear him when he calls, they're one and the same. Those who come to the light, and those who hear him when he speaks. Jesus is speaking to Pilate. Jesus had this opportunity to plead for his life, you understand. That's what Pilate expected Jesus to do. That's what all men did when they come to this point. They plead for the life. This really confounds Pilate greatly that Jesus has stopped pleading for his life. Right, you see, right. this just really throws him. This right. just throws him, and uh, he doesn't know what to think. He's, he, you know, Pilate would like to be one that's running right now. But he can't run because God's appointed this, this confrontation. In John 18, 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. Yeah. To this end I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Jesus just could have just as easily inserted the word light there for truth. You see. For we understand light. And truth are really one and the same. Light, truth, and life, these realities are all found in Jesus. You see, they're interchangeable, aren't they? Jesus is the truth of the message we preach. And if it were not for the testimony of that, well, of that particular thing, it would be just another message. If Jesus wasn't in the message, it would be just uh, another message out there that we hear. The gospel, it does the same work. It does the same work that Jesus did when he was physically on the earth, rescuing men and healing men and opening up the eyes of the blind. It has that same power. It, it meets Jesus. It, it meets Nicodemus at night and talks to him. It calls Zacchaeus down from the tree. It goes over to Samaria and meets the woman at the well. It goes over the gathering region and casts a demon out of the demoniac. See, Jesus and this truth. There are those who belong to the truth. When they hear it, they respond. Yeah. In both places, John 3 and, and John 18, 37, which I just read this uh, confrontation with Jesus and Pilate, 18, 37, this is what's being said. To this end I was born, and for this cause I came into the world. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, mm -hmm. and that they are wrought in God. I want to come back to this uh, John 9 account again. Jesus is leaving a lengthy engagement with the Jews in the uh, previous chapter. And it, if you remember, it all started, this whole thing all started when Jesus, when uh, the woman was caught in, uh, they claimed in the very act of adultery. <clears throat> and it ended with Jesus, uh, with the Jews, excuse me, it ended with the Jews wanting to cast stones at Jesus again and he, and he uh, hid himself among and he, and he left. But with this discourse, uh, discourse in mind, you know, Jesus goes into the, he goes into the ninth chapter with all these things having taken place. And as Jesus passed by, okay, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And remember, his disciples asked, "Master, who did this sin? Yeah. This man or his parents that he was born blind?" <clears throat> now, the man was born blind. It pre it presented to the disciples a, a, some kind of a, a theological problem that what. Well, they want to try to figure this out. What happened here? But see, Jesus, he didn't, you know, he didn't go there at all. He, he, he knew exactly. He said, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. Jesus is thinking about light. He's thinking about, I'm the light of the world, and I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. And as long as I'm in the world, he said, in this, in this, uh, uh, this, I'm the light of the world. And so <clears throat> this man perfectly illustrates the condition of all men before God, uh -huh. blind from birth. And see, <clears throat> yes. 
You know, Jesus didn't ask to heal this man, incidentally. I want to point this out. Matter of fact, they probably would have walked right by and he would have never known it, you see. Uh, men, <clears throat> men didn't ask for a Savior, did they? <clears throat> we didn't even know we needed one. God sent us a Savior. Actually, did, Jesus did exactly the same thing here. What he did, he, he, uh, he came into this man's life. He just came in there and uh, uninvited, incidentally. He interrupted his normal life, which I'm sure he's glad he did, but Jesus interrupted his life. <clears throat> what was it that qualified him before God, this, this blind man? What qualified him for Jesus? Well, he was blind, you see. Yeah. That's what qualified him. He hadn't done anything for Jesus to stop and save him. He hadn't done anything. Jesus just stopped and did it. Jesus took clay and spittle, and he put it on his eyes, and he told him to go and wash. Yeah. And the man did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He found his way to the pool of Siloam, and he washed. And so anyway, this is the account. Now the Pharisees, who were repelled by the light incidentally, they found out that this man had received his sight. And you know, as you read this account, you can see, you remember, the, I'm, I'm trusting that you, you're familiar enough to know how this, how this account unfolds, how the Pharisee became more belligerent and more, actually more hateful yeah. while this man, they're, they're, they're falling away yeah. and they're moving away from, from this incident. But the, but the blind man, he's increasing yeah. all along. You remember that? How he increases in this. He's climbing upward, you see, in his thinking. He's, he's advancing in his thinking. He's moving. I start to myself that he's moving. He's yeah. moving to the light, Amen. you see. The religious leaders, they're actually fleeing and falling away. And this blind man, he's moving. <clears throat> you know, uh, when it came to him, he said that he was just a man called Jesus. Who healed him? It's a, a man called Jesus, you see. That was his first response. Later on, uh, he's a prophet when it came back. Now he's a prophet. And, and then later it came back. He's a worshiper of God now. So he's moving. And then finally, he's one who is from God. Only a man from God could do this, you see. And so as the count closes, why, uh, he, he finds out who the Savior is, you see, because Jesus comes back and he tells him, I'm, the, the, I'm, the, I'm he, I'm the very Son of God. So, so in the closing words of this account, Jesus says, for judgment I am coming to this world that they which see not might see and they, which, uh, they that which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees, they overheard this, okay, and they said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin re remaineth. I thought of these words. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to read them all, but you remember in Matthew, we call them the Beatitudes. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are those who are meek, and those who which do hunger, blessed are the merciful and the pure in heart, and it goes on and on and on. These are people who know their condition, you see. Yes. The Pharisees didn't know their condition, is what Jesus is saying. You, you don't know you're blind, but this man knew he was blind. And the, and the, and the people of the world that, uh, that you meet, they're sensitive to the light, and they hear Jesus calling while, while they're men who are uh, open to God, who are blessed of God. Who are they? And, 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 and one situation, you can say there, there are people who are, know they are blind, okay? I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10. All those who come before me were thieves and robbers, Jesus said. He's talking about the shepherds who come before him. They were thieves and robbers. But he said, the thief cometh but to steal and to kill and destroy. And Jesus said, I've come to give life. What kind of life is Jesus talking about? I'm going to have to move along. I'm running out of time. Jesus refers to it as an abundant life, okay? It's an abundant life. It's like a well springing up into everlasting life, Amen. springing up like a fountain is what Jesus is talking about. We're not talking about like a reservoir that holds water, not that kind of well. We're talking about a well where water actually flows from out of it, okay? It's a well of water springing up. It, it, it provides its own uh, pressure, it, it finds its own way to the surface, okay? You don't have to pump this water up out of the ground. If it's got its own uh, energy 
and it, it seeps its way to the top and it comes out. This is the kind of well he's talking about. And <clears throat> men do not dig these kind of wells. It's formed its own way to the surface. Jesus is the fountain of life that God puts in us. This life is a spiritual life, and it's placed within us. It's living water. It's actively flowing water. It's alive. Jesus said it will be in him. That's what he said. This, this living water is teeming with life. It's teeming. It means that it's, it's abundantly filled with life. <clears throat> it's, it's all about life. It's living. <clears throat> it's alive. It's fertile. Okay, teeming. It means it's fertile. Even it, it's even pregnant with life. It's ready. It can give forth life. It's ready to give life. You see, all these are in this word. It's not a static and stationary kind of thing. It's moving. <clears throat> I think of the miraculous catch of fish. Remember that? Well, it was, the nets were teeming with fish. Matter of fact, they were, uh, they, could, they were overflowing. The fish were overflowing the nets. Teeming with life. This is a healthy and robust life. Uh, life. It's alive and, 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 it's, and it's healthy. <clears throat> we are the stewards of this life that we've been given, yeah. you see. And we do what is ever necessary to keep this life teeming with life, to keep it alive and keep, and, and keep it abundant. This, this, this uh, tendency or this natural abundance, we want to keep this. We want to, we want to put, give it every advantage for it to be uh, uh, always active and alive. We want to do anything that would work against this. Now, if we... If we do, it will increase in its abundance, you see. This kind of this kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. If we take care of it like good stewards, it will always increase. For this is it's a, this is the nature of the well, to be consistently flowing forth and giving good things. Now Jesus said, I've come, okay, I've come as a light, and I've come as judgment on the world, and I've come as I've I've come as uh, life to give life. Thank you, brethren. Amen.